Thank you, Chica. Good morning, everyone. Apologies for, I, I don't know many, many words in, uh, in your language, but I will try just to say Buna Ziwa to start. And now let's have a quick look at uh, how the energy future will look like. As Ch 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 Ciprian has, uh, has briefly mentioned, I work at the International Energy Agency, which is a, the global energy authority. We look at all regions, all sectors, all fuels uh, of, the, of the energy sector. And what we do through our annual publication, World Energy Outlook, is that, um, is that we, we analyze uh, the impact uh, of policy makers, of uh, decisions and technologies, and what, is, uh, what are the implications for the energy future. Quick uh, context slide. We see the energy world today is marked by a series of deep disparities. What we mean? One is the, the case of oil. We have a well-supplied oil market, but we also see deep uncertainties in the geopolitical tensions and geo geopolitics. Another big, big gap we have is in emissions. We have a science that is telling us that we need to cut uh, CO2 emissions to avoid the severe climate change impacts. But what we actually see in reality is that emissions are keeping growing. These 2018 numbers show emissions went up. Another disparity is access. Energy access is one of the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. But again, today we have more than 850 million people that don't have access to electricity and 2.6 billion people that still use uh, wood and the traditional biomass to cook, which is very polluting. The good news here is that we have technologies, solar, wind, battery, uh, digitalization can help the, the energy sector, but they cannot do everything alone. We need the policymakers. We need the, a very, very careful look at what are the implications of policies in the energy world. For this reason, as I briefly said, the World Energy Outlook doesn't produce forecasts, but we make projections. So we consider certain policies, what are the current policies, what are the announced policies, and we embed them in our stated policy scenario. And then we consider the long-term uh, objectives that we have in the world, such as uh, uh, pa the Paris Agreement, so considering climate change, considering addressing air pollution, and uh, achieving energy access, and we, uh, through that, we have our sustainable development scenario. As Cuprian said, the future looks interesting. We don't need to be anxious. But we also see that sometimes having a careful look at the past helps clarify and understanding what the future will look like. 100 years ago, we had coal and wood that were the main sources of energy. In 1950, we have wood is uh, uh, reducing, oil is gaining space. 1974, the, the year, when the International Energy Agency have been uh, created, we have the moment when oil share was the largest in history, is about half, is supplying about half of the energy demand. 2000, the picture here is a bit diver more diversified. We have the, uh, the green one, renewables are starting kicking up, Nuclear is gaining space in some regions such as US, but also Europe, etc. And natural gas is, uh, is gaining space for power generation. Since 2000, though, we have two main stories here. The first is China, China being the economic powerhouse. This drove coal to have a very, very important uh, uh, share of, of the pie, as you can see. And the second big story is, as many of you uh, might know, is renewables. 
Solar and wind are gaining more and more space in the power sector. So what we see is that in the past there have been transitions. It can happen, it's not impossible, but the problem that we face from now to 2040 is a problem of scale. In fact, today, uh, sorry, 100 years ago, we had 2 billion people in the planet. Today we are more than seven, and this number is projected to increase. The, economic, uh, the, the, the economy as a whole is many, many times uh, larger than it was at that time, and still is projecting to, to grow. So the problem here is a problem of scale. We need to find ways not only to um, increase sustainability in the energy sector, but also we have to displace some fuels, which is very, very difficult through energy efficiency also. One good news is that not always the future looks like the past. In the past 20 years or so, oil was the uh, most used uh, fuel to supply energy demand growth. But what we project for the future is actually electricity. We all know and see how electricity is important for, for us through uh, smartphones, through lights, etc. So what we see is that electricity will grow much, much faster than the overall energy demand. And how is this electricity going to be supplied? Coal, after 100 years of growth, will flat, will be flat in the next 20 years. This seems quite a, let's say, boring picture, but it's not. There are many, many uh, hundreds of uh, gigawatt under constructions, uh, but we have retirements in many regions in the uh, European, uh, European Union, for example. Still, coal remains the largest source of electricity generation by 2040. Gas, gas keeps growing in our stated policy scenario. Why? because we need the electricity from gas and because gas is very, very well su suited to provide flexibility. Nuclear stays more or less flat, uh, though there is a very big geographical shift. Uh, China, for example, by 2030 is projected to become the largest country with the nuclear power in the world. And then renewables, because uh, we all uh, talk about renewables, of course, but the largest renewable source today is uh, still hydro. Hydro also keeps increasing, uh, driven by China, driven by Latin America, and driven also by Africa, which is developing uh, fast. Wind, wind triples by 2040, it's a good news, and it's also driven by offshore wind. Offshore wind in some parts of Europe is becoming more and more important. We project a 15-fold 15, 15 increase in offshore wind capacity by 2040. And Europe is a very, very important place for the technology. And then the big winner, solar PV, that by 2040, actually a few years earlier, becomes the first source of power capacity in the world. What does it mean? Renewables as a total uh, make two thirds of the total uh, capacity additions in this, uh, in this period. Variable renewables, such as solar and wind, will be, will, will be a very, very large part. But uh, having a higher share of variable renewables has some implications for electricity security. Electricity security is one of the most modern aspects of energy security. Why so? Flexibility. Flexibility needs have always uh, been in the power market, but will become more and more important in the future. They will increase, they will double by 2040. Here, an analysis that we have done this year is to take every hour in a year for certain regions 
and to understand what are the flexibility needs for that specific hour. For European Union, the dot there means that one from that hour to the next, we had a 20% increase in flexibility needs. What does it mean to be uh, practical? This means from one hour to the next, adding the equivalent of the average hourly demand of France, which is a lot. And this happens also in India. We actually see, which is quite a, a nice story, that some of these events are linked to, to sport. In India, this was linked to cricket. In European Union, this was linked to the uh, final World Cup. Maybe here in, uh, in Romania, this is linked to Simona Halep uh, finals, maybe, which I like very much. Flexibility needs can also be negative. What does it mean, ramping down? This happens, for example, when the wind uh, production increases fast. This is the period where wind is quite, is quite large, but demand decreases. So we need to ramp down some flexibility, some production of electricity. And as I, I was saying, flexibility needs. So here you have um, 8,760 hours of the 2018 in 2040 you see the range is much, much larger. This is what we mean by flexibility will grow and will grow much faster than electricity demand. This will require conventional power plants to be on, on, the, on the game, interconnectors, but also new sources of flexibility. Demand response has a huge, huge potential and batteries. Batteries, why? Cost reductions are fast and much faster than, than expected. Modular, very, very short uh, uh, cost, um, construction period. But it's, we cannot take for granted all this. We need to have the right markets, the right conditions for, uh, to attract investment. So we have some good news. We see, okay, that we have more renewables. Power sector seems to be uh, decarbonizing, but we still have some issues and the points that we have to consider. We are not done. We have in the world today more than 2,000 gigawatt of coal. Why this is important? This is important because 40% of this capacity is subcritical, which, what, what does it mean? It's very, very inefficient. And two-thirds of this capacity is in developing economies in Asia. And on average, this coal fleet is 12 years old, which is, it, it's a teenager uh, compared to the average lifetime of coal fleet, which is 50, 50 years, more or less. This means that these coal plants will stay there for many years. And what, what does happen if uh, those plants stay there for so many years? This means that only taking plants that are on the ground today or under construction, coal will remain the largest source of CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. This is not in line with our long-term su sustainable goals. So we have to close this gap. How? We have some choices. CCUS retrofits, very important for plants that are young. This is attracting attention, US, Canada, but also UK and many other regions. Repurposing, what does it mean? This means taking coal plants that are actually not so flexible and converting them so that the characteristics allows to provide flexibility. And then early retirements. This happens, for example, we have a Germany a 2038 phase out plan. So we have to consider also that. Let's have a, a quick look at Europe uh, power sector. Why? Because Europe alone has uh, 16 countries that have endorsed uh, and are uh, uh, following the, the, the idea of phasing out uh, traditional coal-fired power plants. But coal, nuclear, and gas are still very important in the power system. And if we want to achieve the long-term 
uh, the long-term goals of European Union, we need to decarbonize the energy sector. And the power sector needs to be the first one. So how do we do? Renewables, bioenergy and hydro will play a role, but again, wind and solar, there are the winners. The first, the big winner here is offshore wind. Offshore wind will become the largest source of electricity generation in Europe uh, by 2040. But another point that we have to consider to be, to have a sustainable energy world is that current trends uh, show that emissions are still on an upward trend. This means that emissions uh, would increase one percentage every year. If we consider, as I said, policies that are current, but also announced, we have some improvements. This is our stated policy scenario. We have emissions that are a bit lower, but still you see that they are growing. They are not on a downward trend. The downward trend is the sustainable development scenario, which is aligned with the Paris Agreement. But to do so, we need technologies, we need policies. Technologies like efficiency renewables, uh, fuel switching, for example, more electrification, CCUS and others. So a host of technologies is required. There is no simple, no easy solution to reach these targets. And this is very, very important. Final conclusions, based on what we said, oil and gas are still important. Uh, I skipped the slide on shale, but shale gas and oil are still uh, very important in the world energy picture. The technologies that are uh, changing very quickly, the power system, solar, wind, storage, digitalization. But as I said, technologies are, go are, are good, but policymakers also need to do their job in providing the good path for the energy system. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, I would have a first question. Um, I mean, you, you presented how the world will look like uh, in the next decades. Um, I was curious if you can share with us briefly, how do you feel in this part of the world, in Eastern Europe, we're doing uh, um, from all the perspectives, but in particular, um, I know you're also looking at air pollution. Uh, so how bad is it, how good is it, and what's the aspiration and hope? On that. So in general, European Union, uh, we have uh, uh, strong targets uh, in terms of uh, power and energy system decarbonization. We have the 2030 targets, and then we have this draft, the EU long-term strategy for 2050, which is the one that we consider for carbon neutrality in the slide on uh, offshore wind in Europe. But as, uh, as you were saying, air pollution is a problem. Uh, it's mainly driven by coal, coal use uh, not only in power, but also in industry. Uh, there are some cities and some areas in Europe where this problem is still very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is even bigger in countries like India, like China, where uh, coal is uh, the biggest source of uh, electricity and it's much larger than Europe. And so there we have thousands of uh, premature deaths due to air pollution. We have some good news. There are standards uh, that the countries are implementing, uh, not only for coal, but also, for example, for cars. I mean, Europe has a very, very high standards uh, for diesel and uh, gasoline. Uh, but still, there is a long, long uh, way to go. Yeah. Are there any questions from Claudia from the audience? Uh, we have some mics. We have one here and one somewhere there. Uh, hello, Claudia. In the slide that you showed the, the power mix generation for uh, 2040, yeah. that was in uh, installed capacity, right? Yes. 
but the actual production for uh, renewables, especially for wind and uh, solar, is going to be much lower. So in effect, they're going to be, let's say, two-thirds of uh, total installed capacity. But for uh, actual power generation, it's not going to be that high. So I think the main ge generation is still probably going to come from uh, uh, natural gas and from nuclear. And as you mentioned, uh, there's going to be quite a big need for uh, uh, storage capacity in order to, to balance the system. There is or there isn't, sorry. There is. There is, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, as I said, the coal uh, remains the largest uh, source of electricity generation. Gas also is very, remains very important. But renewables reach uh, almost 50% by 2040 of, in terms of generation. Of course, uh, wind and solar gain a lot of shares because the increase is happening for these two sources. Uh, but hydro generation becomes also very, very important in many regions. So you are right. This is uh, due, of course, to the different uh, utilization rates of the power plants. Coal and gas run more often in a year compared to solar and wind. And for, and for hydro, do you consider uh, only hydro will be below 10 megawatt install capacity or all hydro? Uh, there is runoff river and there are also big plants. China is uh, today in this, this, this uh, I mean, under the 2020s. May I suggest you have this conversation, which is uh, very interesting uh, in the break, because we have a, uh, another question there. So we only have time for one question per person, if you... Hello. Uh, what's the argument over the flat line or in some other slides, the decreasing line over nuclear? Why don't we? Why? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the question because uh, usually I don't have time to explain the flat line of nuclear and it, it's good that you ask this question. Uh, as I said, uh, it's flat, it seems a bit boring, but it's not. Uh, hides uh, a lot of geographical shifts. Uh, nuclear is being retired in uh, some countries in uh, Europe. Uh, France is a big contributor there. US is also declining. But we have countries like in, uh, India, but China mainly, that are investing a lot and are building most of the new power plants. So the flat line, it's flat, but the contribution of different regions uh, is changing quite a lot for the technology. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, you can see Claudia um, at 2.30 as well in Mezzanine in a conversation about the future of batteries and storage with Simon Harris, moderated by Andrei Kovatariu. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. And we'll move to the next speaker now. Thank you.